first question. Australia has been involved in bidding for football World Cups before and it didn't go so well. What made you want to be involved in another one and not only be involved but the person in charge? Well, you're very, you're exactly right. It didn't go to plan, the Men's World Cup bid, and I was part of the team that um, helped put that bid together. Um, but I, I believe in the power of hosting major events, especially major sporting events, and football is... Um, is a passion of mine. So I really wanted to be part of an opportunity to try again, to bid again, but this time for a Women's World Cup. Um, and so in 2017, myself and my colleague, Mark Falvo, put the case forward as to why we should be bidding to host the FIFA Women's World Cup. And pleasingly, we had support from all of the governments um, to help back the bid. And, uh, and yeah, here we are today um, with almost one year to go in planning and preparation before we open the gates on the 20th of July in 2023. Pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. <laughs> And I suppose that organising a bid for such a, huge, for such a huge event is really stressful, but what was the most enjoyable part of the bid process? Um, so many, so many enjoyable parts of the bid process. One is uh, about building the team. So for me, this is why I love major events. It's all about the people. It's all about the people we bring together who are all here for one common goal, one common purpose, and that is to deliver the greatest and the, the biggest ever FIFA Women's World Cup in 2023. And um, what What's been so great is a number of the people that worked with me to put the bid together have stayed on and so we built this fantastic team and everyone's still here together um, working towards this this one amazing goal that we all have yeah and what does seeing this photo <laughs> make you feel um very proud um it makes me feel a lot of joy and also a lot of relief um going into that night um you know, we, we had no idea what was going to happen. And on the eve of the announcement that we were on the foreshore of the harbour, we had Julie Dolan, you'd know Julie Dolan, yeah, the first um, Matilda's captain. And we had Steph Catley and we had Lids and we had Alana and we were, you know, it was a whole great bunch of us there and we were so excited um, and also so anxious because we just had no idea what the outcome was going to be. And then when we, we lit up the Sydney Opera House with all of those amazing photos that you would have seen, um, which was really building the momentum and the excitement. And so I think we went back to the office and we we're all waiting for the announcement. And that, that leap, that jump was definitely fueled by, you know, joy and, um, and relief as well. Yeah. Um, the person, the cameraman and the, or camera woman in the corner must have just had to get the exact, like, perfect shot. Well, that photo was taken by Anne Odong. Do you know Anne? Anne knows everything there is to know about women's football. And, um, yeah, she did an unbelievable job in capturing that. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and in 2019, Sarah Walsh from Football Australia said, we are aiming for 50-50 gender equality by 2027 mm -hmm. and hosting the FIFA Women's World Cup in 2023 in Australia and New Zealand would fast-track our push to reach this target. Even though COVID has messed up things um, around a little bit over the last two years, do you think the World Cup can still help achieve this goal? Oh, absolutely. So hosting major sporting events always leads to greater participation. So more girls and boys putting on the boots to play football. And we saw that after the Asian Cup in 2015, which was a fantastic tournament as well. And so for us, this is all about legacy. And so when we started bidding to host the tournament, we thought about what do we want to leave behind after we've hosted and what do we need to do to make sure we're ready to be able to do that, to leave these positive um, outcome, memorable moments for everyone who's involved. And so making sure that we can promote football to as many people as possible and not just in Australia and not just in New Zealand, but right around the world, right around the Asia Pacific region is really, really important. And so absolutely we're going forward. We want to have 60 million women and girls playing football by 2026. And so what that means here for Australia is for Football Australia, who are driving legacy here, um, continue to promote the game, how fun it is, how exciting it is, how great it is to be part of a team and to play with your mates. And so we want more people to experience that and more people to play the game. And more people will learn about the game from hosting the FIFA Women's World Cup. Yeah. Um, and you said in an interview just after the winning bid, I don't think people yet understand what's about to happen. With one year to go, do you think people understand yet? 
I think people are starting to understand. I think the the understanding is is coming, and um, as we continue to tell the story about what's uh, what the FIFA Women's World Cup will do, I think people will be starting to absolutely realise. And one year to go is a really important milestone. Uh, one year to go is all about unity. It's all about bringing people together, and that's the beautiful thing about football because it really is the game that connects everyone from all corners of the globe. And so, yeah, we we just can't wait. We're super excited. Yeah, um, and I think it's great to have a woman in charge, especially you, um, <laughs> in charge of such a big women's sporting tournament. Do you think that it's important for women to be leaders of events like this? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's important for um, women to have the opportunity to lead. And, you know, we've set up such a fantastic organising group of people that support each other, support uh, the development of female leaders. Our Chief Executive Officer, Dave Beach, um, he's 100% supportive behind developing female leaders right through uh, sport and through football. And I think developing female leaders both on and off the pitch is really important. So it, that's also about uh, coaches, referees, um, administrators, through all levels of the game. So the more we can inspire um, and empower more women to be leaders, I think the better off for all of us because different types of leaders mean different types of thinking. and that that ends up with better business decisions. We kind of spoke about this in a few questions before that um, they're aiming to get 60 million girls around the world playing and mm-hmm. women playing soccer. But the survey in 2019 said that about um, 1.95 million women and girls in Australia play football. Mm-hmm. Apart from attending games, how will the World Cup give them a chance to be involved? So there's so many opportunities for involvement um, for women and girls around the FIFA Women's World Cup. Um, there's the volunteering opportunity, which is, of course, something that's open to everyone. Um, we also have, there'll also be programs around uh, the kids that walk out with the teams. So fantastic opportunity to be part of the tournament in that way. And then, of course, just being in the stands, being able to watch these games, to cheer on their heroes, the best footballers in the world playing here in our own backyard. There is no better opportunity. And just looking at these players as amazing role models and seeing what they can achieve, which will inspire all of us to go beyond greatness. Yeah, definitely. Um, and how do you and the organisers work with Football Australia to make sure that the impact of the to- of the tournament at grass at a grassroots level is not just temporary? Yeah, great question. So we work hand in hand with uh, Football Australia uh, to make sure that there are long lasting legacies from hosting the FIFA Women's World Cup. So Football Australia has Legacy 23. You may have seen their legacy plan. So that talks about participation. So development, um, developing new programs to make sure more opportunities to play, um, investing in training sites, um, making sure that we have female-friendly training sites and facilities, making sure that there's opportunity for everyone to play on the best pitch possible, um, making sure that we're also developing female leaders, as I touched on earlier. And then there's also the high-performance pillar, and that's really around making sure that we do everything possible to set the Matildas up for success. And then there's also a really important uh, legacy pillar around tourism. So we want to make sure we're welcoming the world here in 2023 and so everyone can experience the uh, hospitality that we're going to show them um, when they come here to watch the FIFA Women's World Cup. Yeah. Um, and we're seeing crowds... We're seeing crowd records constantly being broken overseas for women's football, the Euros, Champions Mm. League and other examples. That must excite you about what is possible next year. Oh, so excited. Watching the Euros now, you know, the huge crowd they had at the opening, just for us, is super exciting and it shows us how far we can go and we really want to take this tournament beyond greatness. We want to see full stadiums and we want to make sure we leave memorable moments for the fans, for the players, for our workforce and our volunteers and for everyone who's involved. Uh, so it's fantastic to see the success of the Euros and we think we can even take that further. Yeah. Um, and I actually interviewed Matilda star Clara Legazzo earlier this year and asked her about the World Cup being at home and she said how she hopes girls like me will be inspired by the World Cup just like she and many other of today's athletes were by the Sydney Olympics. That must excite you but also remind you of what a huge responsibility it is. Huge responsibility. So, I mean, our job is to set the stage 
And so we set the stage so the players can perform at their best on the world stage. And it's a huge responsibility to make sure we're doing everything we can to promote football through this and to really um, provide opportunity for girls like yourself to watch their role models play here. And yeah, it's really it's a really exciting opportunity and something we're very passionate about. Sunday 20th of August, hopefully there will be 80,000 people at Stadium Australia for the final. I'm um, sorry, <laughs> have you imagined or dreamt what the occasion will be like? I have, I really have. Um, so I used to work at Stadium Australia many, many, many years ago. So I know what a full house feels like and that energy and the excitement, you cannot replace that. So I absolutely have, I've thought about what we can do at the end of the tournament to really mark how huge it's been, um, how we're going to celebrate and, um, and you know, how we're going to deliver that closing moment, the most memorable moment of the tournament to, to everyone, to the world. So I've definitely thought about it um, and look, let's see who's going to be there. Who knows, the competition's going to be fierce. Yeah, definitely. And what do you think that this tournament can do for girls and women in Australia and New Zealand beyond football and sport? Well, one of the things we like to talk about here at the FIFA Women's World Cup is this push for gender equality. And so major sporting events like the FIFA Women's World Cup can be a catalyst for social change. And we like to use that platform to talk about really important things. And so gender equality is one of those. So we're going to keep you know, moving the dial on that and, and we will. And we can see that already happening. But we keep the conversation going and we inspire more women and girls um, to participate in sport, um, to become leaders in sport. And we know that's going to take the growth and the trajectory of women's sport even further. 